Well, good afternoon, everybody. I hope you all had a great lunch break, visited all the vendors. Okay, sorry, wrong convention. Um, we have a really exciting afternoon planned for you, and we're starting out with Greg Marks, who's going to talk to us about hail damage, and particularly the sorts of issues that we find in the Northeast. Greg is a registered professional engineer in Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Delaware, and Maryland with 25 years of experience in structural and architectural engineering. He's been the engineer of record on many commercial, industrial, institutional, and condominium structure projects and facade restorations. Greg has also been the inve expert investigator on numerous structural failures and wall water infiltration claims and litigations. He's an approved demolition special inspector in the city of Philadelphia. Before this started, I had to find out about that. I don't know if he'll, he'll mention any of that in his presentation, but it's very fascinating work. And a certified residential and commercial roofing inspector. Greg earned his Bachelor of Architectural Engineering degree from the Pennsylvania State University. He currently leads the Forensic Engineering Department at Barry Eisen and Associates, serving building owners, insurance companies, and attorneys. So without further ado, as they say, um, take it away, Greg. Oh, one more thing. If you have any questions, there's a chat function on the bottom of your screen, or a Q&A function, I'm sorry. There's a Q&A function. Just type your questions in and we will, uh, if time permits, answer them at the end of the presentation. So don't be shy, just, um, you know, please ask whatever you want. But I think that, Greg is going to have so many, uh, he'll be telling us so much that maybe we won't have any, who knows, but at any rate, <laughs> take it away, Greg. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah. I really appreciate that uh, introduction and welcome everyone. Good afternoon. I'm uh, used to being there in person like the rest of everybody, but we are going to do our best uh, virtually today. So the first thing I'm going to do is share my screen and make sure that everything is showing up adequately for everyone. And Brittany will keep me honest with that. So hopefully everyone's seeing, seeing the presentation at this time. Should be my title slide. And not seeing it yet, Greg. You're not seeing it yet. And give me one second for a uh, technical difficulty. How about now, Brittany? We can see everything now. Yep. Good. Okay, hopefully that was the hard part. So diving in, again, uh, good afternoon. Thank you again, Sarah. And um, what about this, uh, this crazy title, uh, Hail Damage or Black Magic? The, the, the reason I, I chose that title is because there seems to be some kind of um, um, mystique around hail claims. Uh, there are so many sort of different issues surrounding hail claims that uh, seem to be uh, argued about. Um, and they so frequently uh, come across our desk that there, there's, there's a lot of reasons for that. And this presentation is going to get into uh, some of those reasons. 
And uh, some of them are intuitive and some of them maybe not so intuitive. So um, uh, we're gonna take a look at that. And uh, we'll also learn a little bit about hail, um, but mostly about damages. And then at the end, I have a few uh, fun videos regarding um, our use of drones, which is uh, all everyone's, you know, usually uh, finds, finds drones interesting. So we'll take a look at that at the end. But let's, uh, let's get into this. One thing you're gonna hear me talk about throughout this presentation is the context of the investigation. And what I'm really driving at there as I give you a moment to soak up the uh, the comic here, is when we're doing a hail inspection, what we're really looking at is we're looking at the in, the entire property as as a whole picture and 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 as a puzzle. And what I find a lot of times is there's this emphasis where, you know. There's a forest for the trees situation where there's, you know, damage on a shingle that's being argued about. And it's really going about the hail investigation backwards. Really, there's, there's a big to small uh, way to approach uh, a hail in investigation. And if you start very small, you can really miss the, the forest for the trees. And the things I'm talking about are, in the beginning, you're first just trying to figure out, did hail even strike this site? And there's a lot of ways to, to, uh, to try to figure that out. There's, uh, you'll hear me mention NOAA throughout the presentation, National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration. So that's the federal national resource for uh, weather information. And that's fed by trained spotters. There's individuals who actually um, see the hail and estimate the size and report it to that resource. So that's a really fantastic resource that we like to start with just to find out, is it likely that hail even struck the site? The other thing that is really important on a hail assessment is you know, everybody runs up on the roof right away, but there should be evidence on the site of, of hail. Um, and there are things like um, uh, air conditioner grills tend to get banged up by hail and leaves a very signature mark. Covers for patio furniture, uh, even decks and sidewalks that kind of have that little layer of algae on them, they get hit by hail. And it leaves a, a, a telltale, they're called spatter marks. So there's all these kind of things that we're looking at from big to small as, as, as we approach the site. So we don't miss the forest for the trees. But then the second question is, how big do we think the hail was that hit this site? And there's, um, there's a few tricks and formulas to figure out looking at the size of a spatter mark and uh, looking at a dent in an air conditioner fin or in metal as to how big that hail was. And these are all pieces of the puzzle that uh, get put together before you're even really doing a roof assessment. So you're gonna hear me talking about context. You're gonna hear me uh, talking about working from big to small uh, and looking at the site as a whole. You're gonna hear those throughout the presentation because it's, it's really critical to do all of that due diligence before we get too hung up on uh, e examining an actual, uh, you know, potentially, you know, hail damaged shingle. So here, just coming attractions, we'll look at how often are we getting severe hailstorms in our neck of the woods. We're gonna understand, this is a big one. I like this bullet number two and we'll have a whole slide on this. The hail size thresholds for damage. Um, it's, it's generalized, but there are things you can say about how big hail has to be before it's likely to damage a certain type of roofing. And there's a bunch of asterisks and qualifiers on that 
but that's a that's a that's a neat slide. We'll spend a few minutes on that. Then we're going to go through some uh, pictures from some claims. What is hail damage? What's not hail damage? Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about repairability. That's a, another huge argument that comes up. That you know, it won't necessarily be an argument about did hail strike the roof, but it'll be an argument of is the roof repairable. Um, we're not going to get into the economics, economic feasibility of repairability, because that's that's pretty easy. That's just um, you know how much is damaged and is it more economical to replace those shingles than replace the roof. What, what we're going to talk about is is the roof in too bad of a shape to be repaired. And then lastly, uh, we'll end with the fun stuff, which is some uh, some drone videos. So again, we won't spend too much time on the uh, the mechanics of hail and what is hail. I think most people have seen and experienced hail, but there are a few things that we should know just as a basis going into our discussion of hail. And uh, it's it's basically an ice ball that grows and gets circulated in the atmosphere. Um, during a storm, the wind sort of keeps carrying it up and it refreezes and comes back down. Uh, hail varies in hardness. It could be almost like a slush ball or it could be, you know, really hard ice. Uh, hail always fails in a, falls in a random pattern, which is, you know, that's intuitive. Uh, seems like why do we care about that but that's actually turns out to be a big deal when you're doing an assessment because any damage you're seeing that's not random it's not hail so that's a very uh fantastic litmus test when you're doing a hail assessment and uh hail falls with directionality so it's it's you know it's being driven by the wind so those are those are some some pretty important characteristics to keep in the back of your mind and I threw this picture in here because it's really shocking how big hail can get. Uh, and you're not going to see that around here. That's in the Midwest, and which is actually the highest prevalence of hail is in the Midwest. And it's also why I won't be moving there anytime soon. Really, uh, really big damaging hail, hail claims out there. So again, uh, there are some standardized uh, size conventions for discussing hail. And uh, this was necessary because I mentioned those train spotters. So if everyone's out, you know, these train spotters are reporting back to NOAA, they really have to be using the same vocabulary. And so these are the common sort of household objects that have been agreed upon for uh, indicating size of hail. Um, one little sort of oddball situation is they used to call uh, a mothball used to be marble, but uh, I, I guess there's different size marbles. So now marble is mothball. <laughs> I'm not sure how necessary that change was, but anyway, uh, these these are the, the the common household objects that you'll refer to the to uh, to hail for size around here. Okay, so this this quarter size one inch, that's that's important for a few reasons. Uh, number one, that's really what the National Weather Service is going to call the starting size for uh, severe. So you can see at the top there it says you know severe levels starting at one inch. That's quarter size. The other thing is, uh, you around in, in this area. Uh, much bigger than that, you see the bar at the bottom of the uh, of the chart. Much bigger than that is going to really start to get rare, and 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 the bigger is going to get rare really fast. Uh, in my experience, I've uh, you're never really sure the exact size of the hail, so I'll be generous and say that I've never seen anything uh, bigger than two inches. And, uh, and in reality, probably more like golf ball would be the biggest uh, hail that I've seen. And, you know, in 25 years, that's only probably been, I would say, uh, I would say less, less, than a, less than a dozen times. So, so pretty rare to have a strike uh, of that size. Um, 
And this will also play into our discussion of damage thresholds because we're gonna discuss the size of hail required to damage certain roofing components. And what you're gonna to start to get a flavor for is you're really not talking about damage to most roofing components until you're in excess of an inch. So until you're getting into um, you know, what they call severe size hail, you'll see that most roofing components should, uh, should be able to handle that. Uh, another big app, there's a few big asterisks with that, but I'll save those for uh, when we get to that slide. So again, in my experience, we're gonna be less than two inches around here and most, most likely well less than two inches. And this chart's kind of tiny, but I'll, 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 I'll uh, relay what, 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 I'm, what, I'm, what it's showing here without having you try to see all the tiny little numbers. This is, uh, this is also from NOAA. And what it's saying is for a given area, how many days a year do you have hail one inch or greater in size in happening sort of at least one time? And again, the numbers are very small, but if you look sort of in our little world of Pennsylvania there, you know, maybe where the, um, where the PAMIC convention would normally be had, uh, South Central Pennsylvania, you're looking at three, four, something like that. So you're talking about, you know, three or four days a year that you're gonna have hail uh, one inch or greater. And on one sense, that sounds like, wait a minute, um, that, that maybe sounds like a lot, but I think the thing to keep in mind with hail, again, we didn't go too far into the mechanics of it, but the thing with a hail storm is, hail storm is only on average about six miles long and about a mile wide. And in that six miles, you know, your smaller hail is at the ends, and then it gets bigger and bigger and bigger toward the middle. So you might really only have a mile out of that whole storm that's really producing severe size hail. Now it's moving at the speed of the storm, but you know that's only uh, going to last for a few miles as well. So you, you know you've heard of hail swath reports, and they'll show you sort of this you know path that you know, potential uh, hail of certain size and so forth. And that's really what they're trying to indicate is these occurrences of these very small uh, uh, storms. I mean, the storm's bigger, but the air that's producing the hail is very small as it's moving across an area. So when you picture something that small and you say three or four days a year that that's gonna happen, you're, you're, you're not picking up a lot of geography. You're not picking up a lot of land area. So uh, prevalence is uh, considered low to moderate in our neck of the woods. So here's a slide that I was referring to earlier, which is really, really an important slide. This is the one that's talking about how big does the hail have to be before it really starts to cause damage to certain roofing components? And um, so you can see one inch, that's our wonderful severe, start of severe size hail. And you're looking at damage to lightweight, um, usually like a three tab, uh, the more uh, inexpensive type of shingle, but you're already, already up at a one and a quarter inches for damage to uh, architectural laminate shingles, and uh, even one and a half inch for then the more robust roofing like wood shakes, clay tile and slate. So um, it's, it's not really that easy to get a storm of that size um, and actually get damage to those components. Now here's the huge asterisks that I keep referring to. One is the age of the roof, uh, the older and more deteriorated the roof is, the lower it's going to bring that threshold down. So you could see a very old, deteriorated, lightweight composition roof might get damaged by a three-quarter inch hail. 
So these are not absolute numbers. You have to take the age of the roof into account. The other thing is you're gonna hear me talk about roof backing. Um, most shingles are tight against plywood. So it makes them a little harder to damage. But some shingles like the ones on the ridge of the roof are over um, uh, like a venting mesh or like a ridge vent. And you can imagine if something hits a shingle that's not tight up against plywood, it's gonna be a lot easier to damage. So, um, so whether those roof, roof materials are backed and the age of them also plays uh, an important role. So um, it's one thing to talk about hail. It's another thing to experience it. So let's, let's do that right now. So uh, re really destructive stuff. And uh, you're looking at ping pong ball to golf ball size. I think I'm favor golf ball size for that particular video. And uh, just the, uh, the, 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 the amount of destruction there is, um, is, uh, is very severe. So, okay, it looks like we have our first poll question. I'm curious, we have uh, quite a few folks on the uh, seminar here. I'm curious what you've seen, whether it's in your personal life or in your uh, claims activity. So take a moment and uh, let me know what you've seen and we'll, uh, we'll talk about it in a bit. Okay, so here's another big one, functional damage. When we're looking at damage to the roof, we're looking at basically anything that has, uh, anything that's, um, that, that whether hail was present and if it's caused anything uh, wrong with the roof whatsoever. And it kind of falls into two baskets, cosmetic damage and functional damage. And the big difference, functional damage, and I think this is pretty intuitive, functional damage is, reduction in water shedding capability. So basically something's been affected that it's not gonna shed water or could even leak. Um, and that's typically gonna be a bruise or, or a tear or a puncture. But the other one is reduction in long-term service life. So maybe it's not been affected how it's gonna shed water, but if its life is gonna be shortened, we would also consider that functional damage. The big thing with shingles is there's a fiberglass mesh inside the shingle. And that mesh, if that's ruptured, that's what we call a bruise. And that is guaranteed gonna be functional damage. And you have to feel that with your finger. It's like a bruise on an apple. Or if you can lift the tab up, you can look at the underside. It's not, it's not possible to really just look at a shingle and say that is or isn't hail damage. It really has to be manipulated with your hand or look at the underside. Uh, granule loss is pretty common, you know, especially for some of the smaller hail that's not big enough to damage the shingle, it'll just cause uh, granule loss. We put that in the cosmetic uh, damage basket as well as uh, dents in metal components. You're also gonna put those in the, uh, in the cosmetic basket. So this is to illustrate that point is, you know, is this hail damage? So, so maybe, and, and why maybe? Because 
here's what we're doing is we're looking right under a microscope at a couple of marks on a couple of shingles. And if you remember back to the beginning, this gets back to the context of the site. If, um, if these are randomly distributed over one whole side of the roof, that's going to be one point in, in the hail damage uh, direction. If we're finding evidence on, throughout the site of dents and damage, that's going to be another point in the direction of hail damage. So, but let's assume we have all that going on. We're also going to need then to touch, push on, and try to feel if the mat is broken uh, with our finger and maybe even lift the tab and try to see if the mat is ruptured underneath. So just to look at these pictures and ask if it's hail damage isn't, isn't really fair because we have to get back to that holistic way of looking at the site and we have to manipulate the, uh, the shingles with our, with our fingers. Now, sometimes the hail is so big and here you see this nice random distribution. You, you, you know before you touch this that it's very likely gonna be damaged. And in this case, absolutely was. I mean, here you're talking about golf ball plus size hail and, um, and uh, you know, guaranteed uh, damage in this, in this situation, which was verified in the field. Now, here's this unbacked component that I talked about earlier. You can see you're looking at some ridge uh, shingles on the left, ridge cap shingles. And what happens there is because there's that soft venting material underneath that, sometimes it doesn't take a very big hail strike to tear uh, that shingle because it's not tight up against the piece of plywood. Um, on the right picture, what you're seeing is what it looks like when the mat has been ruptured by hail. You'll actually see it's like a netting that is, is pushed down. And that's, that's the kind of thing we're looking for. On the left, there's no doubt. We don't have to pick that up and manipulate it. That's an actual tear. On the right was a bruise. And uh, what, you, what you really want to do, if you can, is look at the underside. But again, it's like a bruise on an apple. So if you're pushing your finger down and you get to it and it feels a little mushy, you can, you can guarantee that that mat has been, has been uh, broken. Uh, slate is, is a little easier. We won't spend a lot of time on slate, but I wanted to put it in because we do wind up with this on a lot of residential homes. And there are a couple things that are tricky about it. You know, in some ways it's easier than composition shingles because you aren't getting into that, you know, is the mat broken? Isn't the mat broken? Is it bruised? Um, you know, with slate, if you've got a nice uh, uh, recent hail strike, you're going to see this almost perfectly round hole. Um, and we say that's easy, done, slam dunk. But here's the tricky part with slate. And uh, we'll have a couple slides later on some, some uh, damage that mimics uh, hail. But the real tricky part about slate is it's just been around for so long. Most slate roofs are really old. I mean, that's the whole advantage to putting slate on in the first place. And because uh, slate roofs are so old, They've experienced a lot of historical damage, not, uh, you know, and hail, wind, snow, ice. So when you go up to look at a slate roof, it's, it's really uh, sometimes difficult to separate which damages are which, but more importantly, which damages are old and which damages are new. So the, um, the, the, the tricky thing with slate is there's almost guaranteed you're gonna find all those kinds of damage on the roof. The question becomes, uh, when did they happen and how does that uh, jive with the claim period that's being investigated? So that's something you're likely to hear on a slate claim um, is the engineer is likely to find a lot of historical damage 
And it's, it's not always easy to put that in a real tight um, time frame as to when that damage happened. So that's a, that's a discussion you could get into on a slate roof. The other thing I wanna emphasize here is slate weathers by scaling. You can see those sort of thin layers that are trying to come off. That's the natural weathering process of slate. And you know, I've seen a lot of these where we get called out for hail you know, a three quarter of an inch, one inch hail, and the roof's not damaged, but the comment will be that the hail uh, sort of caused some of these thin pieces of scale to come off. And, and, and the answer is it, it did, it certainly did, but it's not considered functional damage. It's sort of analogous to when we have hail that's knocking some granules off um, off a composition roof. It's really no different than the weathering process that would happen naturally. So disturbing these scales is, uh, is not considered uh, functional damage. So that's another sort of little tricky thing that comes up with slate. Here's a view of a barn. We'll see the drone later that took this, this image and the kinds of things here, obviously the nice round holes, we like those because very difficult to argue about that. Uh, missing slates, the nice thing there is what you're looking for is a lighter color underneath the slate that's missing because if it's been missing, here's the thing, you're gonna find a lot of slates that are missing. The question is which ones were missing for the event that you're investigating. And the telltale is the lighter color because what's under there hasn't been exposed to the uh, to the weather. But, and some of these are less noticeable. You see a lot of circles on here. What I'm circling in the other ones is uh, you'll see basically chips, cracks, and breaks. So not as obvious as this nice big, you know, round hole here, but also uh, functional damage from hail. And in this case, again, very old roof on a barn. This hail was probably, you know, one inch at most, probably less, and it was able to do this kind of damage. Why? Because this roof was probably about 100 years old per, per the owner. That was his estimate. Okay, so now kind of the, maybe the more fun part is what kinds of damage can mimic hail? And we see a lot of these. You'll see the term mechanical sometimes in an engineering report, which means it was basically some foreign object, you know, not a, not a natural uh, cause. And, you know, and sometimes that's accidental, uh, workers dropping tools or dragging or staging materials. Those are all sort of in the mechanical basket, but then sometimes they're intentional. And I've seen some of this and uh, pretty much every tool you can imagine. Uh, and we'll see some of that later on some slides. I have some examples of uh, hail that was uh, sort of imitated with, uh, with hammers and, and how to discern that. But then there's this whole other basket, uh, natural weathering of the shingles, uh, manufacturing defects, which is actually more common than you think. Um, and, I'll, and I'll show you one of those. Uh, animal damage and then uh, organic growth. Those are some of the more common things that are sometimes uh, mistaken for, for hail damage. But um, I wanna come back to this context, site context. So, um, do the weather reports show that hail was at or near the site? So that's, that's A number one, due diligence. And typically we're looking at NOAA and uh, trained hail, hail spotters for that information. Then we're gonna start again, working big to small. Holistically look at the site. Is there spatter marks or dents or damage around the site? that would be indicative of hail having struck the site. And uh, the other thing that I'll tell you is too, is the recency. Cause you know, if it was a, if it was a hail strike 10 years ago, you're 
that site information is going to be going to be gone. But if it's something that's happened, you know, within the last few months, you'll you'll see the spatter marks, and uh, you know, the dents will last longer, but the spatter marks uh, will eventually go away. So you're looking around the site for evidence, and you're going to try to estimate the size of the hail from that evidence if you find dents and spatter marks. And then you can say to yourself, you go back to our wonderful uh, hail damage threshold guidelines and you say, well, looks like this hail was probably about an inch. Okay, and it's all, it's a little plus or minus, but you gotta have some idea. And then you look at the threshold and say, well, for this type of roof, you know, that's right on the edge of whether it would do damage. So if the roof's older, I'm probably going to see some damage. If it's newer, I probably won't. And maybe I'll see some damage to unbacked, you know, uh, unbacked shingles, such as at the ridge or so forth. Uh, and at that point, you're ready to go up and start touching and feeling and, uh, and counting and marking uh, what you're seeing on the roof. And don't forget our friend uh, randomly distributed because Random is actually a really tough thing to uh, to fake. So uh, it's it's the signature of hail. There's no other damage that is 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 sort of perfectly random. So that's a that's a really nice thing to keep in your pocket when you're you're trying to determine uh, hail or no hail is 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 this ra random test. So let's look at some other things that mimic hail damage. Uh, lichen, it's uh, sort of this slow growing plant that you'll find on the roof. And um, it's, it's, you know, it's usually a light green or maybe like a yellow green. So right away, you kind of get this vibe that it's organic. And the other thing though, is it's gonna spring up in sort of these little patches. And they're just the parts of the roof that are kind of conducive to what it likes, whether that's with nutrients or shade or sun. So right away, it's not gonna pass this random test at all because it's gonna be sort of here and there in patches. Um, it is destructive to the roof in, in a very long-term way, but it's basically uh, just, just a plant. And incidentally, the reason I, these are in this presentation is because these are all things that I go out to the site and you know, various individuals point to and say, there's hail damage. So these are the ones that sort of most, most frequently come up, sort of the greatest hits. This is another one that comes up a lot. Uh, and it's, what, it's, it's when you have a nail that's not flush underneath the shingle. And that can happen for a couple of reasons. On older roofs, over time, the nails, expansion, contraction, just every season, the nail, some of the nails will actually start to back out, will start to walk out. And that will eventually, you know, first it'll just look like it's uh, the, the, the granules are eroding. And then eventually it'll tear. And then eventually the nail actually comes through the shingle. And that takes a long time. But the other place I see it is even on brand new roofs, if they don't have the uh, air gun set to drive the nail flush and they're, hit, they're putting a lot of nails in that aren't driven flush, it doesn't actually take um, too, too long before you'll start to see those causing issues um, with the shingle above. Um, and usually you'll find some that are kind of younger and they just have the granules are coming off and it's raised a little. Then you'll find other ones that have already made their way through. And they're all sort of in this life span uh, process of, of pushing up through the shingle. Here's another one I get a lot is, you know, the, the hail uh, debonded the tabs on the roof. And that's, that's never been proved or shown. There's, there's, there's no mode by which hail is gonna do that. Um, I always find something else going on. And this was a real interesting one where the uh, plastic strips, when the shingles are in the bundle, that keep the uh, tar strips from um, sticking to the shingle on top, 
but what happened was the plastic strips decided to stick to the tar strips when they took them apart and not stick to the shingle on top. And it prevented all the tar strips from bonding to all the shingles on the entire roof. Uh, again, nothing to do with hail. Okay, on the left, animal damage. And the thing about animal damage is it's usually irregular, you know, because you could picture an animal clawing, chewing, picking. So it's always got this sort of real irregular shape. And um, on the right, you can just kind of see a couple spots that is sort of also, you know, very weirdly shaped and, and, and oddball type of damages. In, in that case, um, uh, usually you find that where people are walking because people like to walk where they feel safer. So this would be what we call uh, footfall damage. And they're usually walking in, uh, in valleys. They're usually walking on the ridge or they're usually walking next to um, a rising wall. You can see on the right, so they can kind of put their hand on it as they go up and steady themselves. So um, footfall damage is another, another real common uh, type of damage. And now this is probably the most common thing that gets mistaken for hail and it's algae. Um, some algae, you know, it looks not so much like hail, but I've seen some algae that really looks a lot like hail damage. It kind of likes to grow in circles. Uh, it does its best to look random, though it's usually, you know, kind of patchy based on the sun and uh, exposure of the roof and so forth. But so algae is pointed to all the time. Um, algae is not damaging to the roof uh, unless you try to pressure wash it which you see in the right picture. I actually see that a lot too. Whenever you see these sort of serpentine marks, it means somebody got up there with a pressure washer and after about two minutes decided it was a bad idea. Um, and, uh, and it is because they blew all the granules off their roof. So again, we have this, uh, this mechanical damage, which are sort of usually these uh, oddball, somebody dropped, dragged or uh did did something to to damage the roof it's kind of a uh, you, you never really know what it was but it, it's not natural and that's that's the part that, that you're looking for weathering some shingles weather in kind of odd ways and that can be because of a manufacturing defect or it can just be uh just the way that that particular shingle weathers but here you can see along the edge of this uh, shingle on the left, the bottom edge, you can actually see the white, which is the, which is the fiberglass mat. And um, uh, which, you know, again, that's, that's weathering. That's something that's happening over a long period of time. On the right, I included that one, not so much the slope in the foreground, but the slope in the background. This is algae, which, um, probably looks a little less like hail than the previous slide, but because um, it's it's a little less well defined. But um, al algae is the one I think I get pointed to the most that um, you know that uh, that turns out not to be hail. Okay, so here's the fun one um, because hammers and ball peen hammers and all those things they're really easy to tell what's going on and uh, for really kind of intuitive reasons. So on the left picture, you can picture if you're swinging a conventional like a claw hammer, what happens is you're not hitting the roof flat with a hammer. You're actually hitting it, um, it's almost, you know, the, the flat part's hitting it, but on a skew, like usually the front end is lower. So hammers actually tend to make these sort of crescent moon tears, uh, which looks nothing like hail. Ball peen hammers have a different problem. They're concentrating all of the force at the end of the, of the cone on the ball peen. And it actually crushes the granules. It powders them, turns them into dust. And these are just, they don't look like what you're expecting to see with, with, with hail at all. Maybe to the person doing it, they do. But based on the slides you saw previous, 
Um, you know, there's just something about these that seems off. Uh, but here's the big one the even easier than that is nobody's good enough to do this damage randomly across their entire roof. It's just, it's just, um, it would be too hard to do it. So what you find is you'll find little patches of these at places where it's very nice and easy to stand. Uh, and if you make a little map, sometimes you'll find that it just, you know, in the valley, on the ridge, um, sometimes people aren't, they're afraid of heights, so they actually do them from a ladder. And then it's like right along the eave. So re really easy to, to, um, to sniff out um, uh, that, that type of uh, intentional damage. So here's, um, this is a, the same analogous thing. We talked about the shingles where the nails try to move up and they create sort of these roundish areas that, that people mistake for hail damage. Same thing happens with slate, which seems kind of uh, odd that something hard could have that same thing going on, but, but it happens all the time. It happens on a much slower rate with slate. And you look at these and you say, well, how could those be mistaken for hail? I see the nail, it's obvious what's going on. That's very true. But if you look at the one on the far left, there's a whole period in time where these things are just starting to erupt through the surface. And that, that uh, condition on the very far left, those get pointed to all the time uh, as hail strikes because they look round and they look kind of crushed and irregular. But um, you will you will almost always find a nail under those those conditions. Okay, we're already up to poll question number two, and this is uh, kind of my 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 selfish uh, curiosity. How often are you seeing sticky hail claims requiring a professional? I'm a, have a, a a curiosity whether these are as uh, maybe troublesome for, for you as um, obviously we don't see them until they go to a professional. So I'm interested in your perspective, whether these claims are causing you heartburn in your worlds. Okay, we're gonna talk about uh, repairability and then uh, do a little bit on drones. So repairability is also the, uh, a, a big argument that we see. So the first argument is, is there hail damage? And you know, let's assume there is. Then the next argument becomes repairability. And there's a few reasons for this. And you know, when I'm, when I'm talking about repairability based on the condition of the roof, is it in good enough condition to repair? Um, I didn't, I'm not talking about economic feasibility, you know, does it make economic sense to repair it? That's really just um, uh, sort of a calculation by whomever's doing, doing costing. This is the sticky one with the repairability based on condition, because if there's one shingle damaged on that roof, and this could apply to wind, it doesn't have to just be hail. There's one shingle damaged on that roof, and it's determined it's in bad enough shape that you can't fix it without damaging more of the roof, you're gonna wind up buying that whole roof. And so you can see intuitively why it's such a big argument. Um, if, you know, if one shingle's damaged and the roof is in too bad a shape to repair, they're gonna get the whole roof. But here's the even trickier part. That determination, whether that roof is in bad enough condition to repair or to that it's in too bad of a condition to repair that there's no standardized way to determine that and you'll hear about the brittle test and we're going to talk about that in a minute that's a kind of a generic term there's no astm there's no standard for determining if a roof is too brittle to repair and we'll talk about that more in a second and here's the other thing why this gets argued about because if you have the the, the older the roof the more likely it is not to be repairable, but also the more likely it is to be the subject you know, of a claim. So, um, so let's dig into that a little bit more. So the inspector, the engineer is really gonna have to pick a shingle 
and try to break the bond of the shingle to the lower shingles and then move that shingle around as if to the extent would have to be done to put a new shingle in. So you're really trying to sort of uh, simulate the things that have to be done to replace that shingle. And here's the problem. If that shingle tears, or if the mat gets torn off of the shingle above when you're trying to lift it up, or it creases or breaks, you can't repair the roof because and every time you go to take, remove the, or uh, debond the shingles and put that new shingle in, you're gonna create three more damages on the adjacent shingle, which is gonna be, um, which is gonna be a snowball effect. So um, here's an example where, you know, I'm manipulating the shingle and you could see the crease in the shingle. So that's, that's bad news because if we try to replace that shingle, we're gonna to have to lift the shingle above it as well. And that shingle is supposed to stay and it's gonna crease and get ruined. And then we just get the snowball. We don't know where to stop. Now, some inspectors will call that a brittle test. Um, you can't look up a brittle test, like an ASTM standard. There's no uh, accepted sort of methodology for a brittle test. So the way we approach it is we basically just we take the shingles, we debond what needs to be debonded. We see if there's going to be damage debonding the shingle, and then we move it through the range of motion it would have to for the repair. And if it survives that, then the roof's repairable. And if it doesn't, then it's not. Um, there's, uh, you know, if the roofer is helping the insured, there's obviously tons of room for conflict of interest here, because if you have somebody doing that who has a vested interest in the roof failing or, or getting damaged you know when you're debonding it you can you know basically do it in a kind of a careless or way and and damage the roof sort of on purpose so gotta gotta be really careful with that i mean that's why we're third party because we're going to call it like we see it um so that you, you just have to be careful that you have somebody who doesn't have a um uh, an interest who's actually doing that, um, doing that assessment. Okay, now the fun stuff. Drones are getting more and more popular and we've embraced them and it's actually been uh, a real help on so many levels, not just on the value of the information that we get, but also on, uh, on, on preserving you know, safety and property. Uh, safety is a big one. You can imagine with all these assessments, all the situations, uh, we're, we wanna be thorough. So we're trying to put our uh, engineers in on as much of that roof as possible. We wanna be able to um, see as much as we can, but sometimes there's reasons why that's uh, not easy to do. Uh, we do use ropes and belays, but the drone has just been a real beautiful uh, additional tool in the toolbox for safety. The other thing is do no harm, which is some roofs are very sensitive to foot traffic, like slate, shake, and tile. And the last thing we want to do is get off a roof and have to report that we broke, you know, a few tiles doing the assessment. Um, not to mention, uh, you know, when you do break, you know, a piece of slate or something, that's also a very serious safety issue because uh, so then you can lose your footing. So there's safety issues and there's uh, property issues and the drone just fits in really nicely to supplement uh, in those situations. And you'd think for that, they would be very expensive. But the amazing thing is they're, they're, not, they're not expensive at all. And I, I think that's why you're seeing them, them taking off. So I'm gonna I'm gonna fire up a video here. This was that barn we saw earlier, and uh, we have an operator here who is doing a flyover.
So in this particular claim, we were able to estimate the size of the hail at about one inch. And this was based on the spatter marks we saw on the side of the barn. And one inch would not normally be enough to harm a slate roof. But again, this was that roof that I had said before was um, estimated at 100 years old. So uh, the size of hail required to do damage to something 100 years old is, uh, is, going, to, is going to be smaller than, than the typical threshold. So, uh, okay, so here's my asterisk on drones though. They're, 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 not, a, uh, they're not right for everything and, and they're certainly uh, shouldn't you know, replace the trained inspector and the site recon. You know, we talked again about context of the site and you know, the, that's where the inspector is gonna be looking around the site for evidence of hail and so forth. And um, the, uh, the drone though is, uh, is, is really gonna be able to do the flyby. It's gonna be able to get you a lot of uh, still photos but if your composition shingle, you still have to be manipulating some representative parts of the roof by hand. So the drone in a composition shingle roof is a wonderful supplement. I would not call it a replacement. I think the drone can be used um, a lot more uh, comprehensively on brittle roofs that you don't have to necessarily be able to manipulate with your hands but we will still always do an Eve review. Even if we can't walk on it, we'll go up on a ladder and review the, the, uh, the slates that are along the edges. So again, it's a tool in the toolbox, not a replacement for good inspector due diligence. So here's another flyby. Okay, so again, incredible imagery. I'm surprised still every time I get one of those, how, how well I can see everything. They are a um, tool in the toolbox, uh, not necessarily a replacement for the inspector's uh, full site due diligence. And they have limitations, uh, overhanging trees and power lines and wind and rain. So you need to have a nice day and a clear roof. And uh, we'll typically do video and stills. The videos are nice for overview, but stills are nice for the damage counts. So fun stuff. I always love to use a drone. Uh, it's um, uh, it's just a, it's just a cool uh, cool way to uh, supplement our assessment. Here's me. Feel free to reach out with any follow up comments. Questions. I think I've just about used up the entire slot, but um, Brittany or Sarah, if you have any uh, poll results or questions that have trickled in, I'd be happy to take a very quick shot at those. Well, we do have one question that might take a little time, but we do, we have a hard um, start for our next session, which is uh, 215. So yeah, I'd be um, happy to answer that one offline if that uh, would if that would. Yeah, help. I think that would be a better idea. But there was absolutely fascinating. I know I've been doing claims for many, 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 many years, and I learned some things today. I love the pictures. Thank you so much, Greg. And we are going to reconvene at two fifteen, and we're going to hear from. Uh, the ATF, we're actually going to hear from uh, 
uh, Tom, who's going to talk to us about forensic accounting and arson investigation. So that'll be really interesting. So this is our forensic afternoon. So thank you very much, Greg and Tom. We're looking forward to hearing your talk. Uh, take care. See you at 2.15. Bye, thank everybody. You. Running a business is more challenging than it has ever been. We know staying competitive and driving your business goals are your top priority. But the cost of compliance is going up, while internal time and resources are going down, all while the cost of an hourly attorney and consulting fees continue to rise. And with those rising fees, you still have limited accessibility and less than ideal response time. So where do you go for answers so you can quickly get back to achieving your business goals? Enquiron is here to provide you with an on-demand, accessible, and easy-to-use solution that you can begin using immediately. It takes just one minute to register, get unlimited support from our client services team, save an average of $12,000 annually, oh, and stay in compliance. Sound too good to be true? Well, it isn't you get unlimited access. Get started today. And suddenly the path toward compliance isn't so challenging. In less than one minute, you can log in or register and be on your way. Stay focused, stay competitive, and drive your organization's business goals. Let Inquiron help with the rest. Our client services team is standing by to answer any questions you may have. Turn your questions into answers. Hey, Tom. Hi, Sarah. How are you? It's so nice that you could be with us. Oh, the pleasure's all mine. It, it should be a lot of fun. Uh, it will be. Um, you're, everybody always looks, I'm waiting forward to hearing from that. You, know, you, the ATF, the embodiment of like all these exciting, uh, fascinating investigations. Um, I loved your bio. Holy cow. Very, um, really impressive. Um, if um, is your name pronounced Chapasco? It is. Very oh, good. beautiful. Yep. You know, I saw that you um, you're a graduate of Providence. I am. My um, nephew, one of my nephews, one of my many nephews, um, has just um, secured a, a position there. He's going to be the uh, organist and choir director at the chapel. Wow. And he's really excited about it. He just graduated um, from, well, Notre Dame was his undergrad and um, Eastman School is his master's, but he's, he's so excited about his new job and being in Providence. Wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful. So he's, so Eastman, he's been in Rochester then. Yeah. Well, I would say that, that Providence and Rochester are somewhat similar size-wise. I think he'll find the arts and culture in Providence might be a little, a little bit wider in Rhode Island and in Providence, uh, with the added advantage of less snow and much better beaches. Um, the ocean here is wonderful. He's he's coming at a great time, so I think he'll enjoy it very much. Oh, I think he will too. Now, my uh, brother-in-law used to be the uh, organist at uh, the Episcopal uh, Cathedral in Providence, and we used to go visit him there and I oh, I just loved going to Providence. Wonderful. That's right on South Main Street. I'm familiar with it. Yeah. Very good. yeah Providence is a is a is a hidden gem, you know, outside of a lot of political uh corruption and issues and a mayor. Well, it's that, just interesting. Yeah. Um but the, the city itself has come a long way from when I was a child. And I, I grew up in Providence. Um and I've lived in Rhode Island virtually my whole life. So I, I know it fairly well. And growing up as a small child in Rhode Island, I could tell you that Providence is very different now in a much better way than it was when I was a kid. Um, it, there's a lot of culture, arts, the city's cleaned up, uh, there are new buildings and restaurants and it's pretty exciting. It, it's, it, it's so, so thank you for your kind words. Oh, you're welcome. Well, um, I guess I'll be visiting once in a while now that 
Gilbert, that's his name, is uh, uh, Gilbert Donahue. Wonderful. Yeah, right. now, now that he's coming on board. Terrific. So, yeah. So now there probably will be questions for your, I just want to close the door here. Oh, okay. So I'm not disturbing the... Um, I came into the office for this, um, so I would be sure to have good internet and I mean, like completely reliable internet. Sarah, but, Sarah, this is Ron. Hey, um, Ron. You're sharing your conversation with all of our register uh, participants. Oh, great. Well, maybe I'm glad. Yeah, maybe you join just, in. I just wanted you to know that. Okay, well, thank you very much. Well, hi, everybody. I hope you're enjoying the chat. I see there's 57 people listening in. So um, if you have questions, we have uh, uh, nine minutes for you to chime in. Oh, my gosh, we already have two. Very what? interesting. Oh, these are that's from the last one. All right. Yeah. What can I say? Yeah, okay, yeah. well, I guess I'm going to take a little cyber break now, but it was great chatting. Pleasure was mine. Nice meeting you. Yes. What's the best way to protect your business? With Donegal Insurance Group, you've poured your energy, your passion, and your heart into this business, and you want it to succeed for generations to come. That's why our agents partner with you to ensure and protect what you've worked so hard to create. Protect your business, protect your future. Visit donegalgroup.com protect to connect with an agent today.
Well, it's 2.15 and time for us to get started again. Maybe. All right, welcome back everybody. It's 2.15 and time to get started. We have a very fascinating presentation this afternoon with the not so fascinating title of ATF Forensic Auditors and Arson Investigation. Tom Chapasco is going to be our presenter and we are going to do, um, we're gonna use the Q&A function um, for questions. And if time permits, we will uh, you know, be able to put them to Tom. But in the meantime, he has a very full agenda. Tom's been with the ATF since 2004. He began his career there as an industry operations investigator, conducting application and compliance inspections on federal firearms and explosives licensees. Sounds scary. He moved into forensic audience auditing in 2007, currently serves as district manager of the Financial Investigative Services Division East Two Group. Tom's casework experience involves numerous arsons for profit, tobacco diversion, firearms trafficking, narcotics in gangs cases, and a murder for hire case. He's testified in federal district court and at federal grand jury. Tom has taught at numerous state and federal institutions. He's a certified law enforcement instructor, a certified fraud examiner, and a member of the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners. Tom is a Rhode Island resident and native and earned his BA and MBA degrees from Providence College, Go Friars. When not working on forensic accounting, Tom enjoys traveling, cooking, and spending time with his family. He's also an avid New England sports fan. And I must add, Go Sox. I'm in with that one, by the way. So be sure to use the uh, Q&A function at the bottom of your screen if you have any questions. And without further ado, I give you Tom Japasco. All right, thank you very much for your warm welcome. And thank you all for listening to my presentation today. As Sarah mentioned, um, I'd certainly be glad to take questions. I'm also certain that uh, this sort of presentation isn't necessarily something that you'll see every day. Uh, not all of you will work arson for profit cases. And uh, as um, Greg Marks mentioned in his hail damage presentation, uh, intentional damage versus hail damage. Well, you know, arson is different than fire. So if, if you've got a, a fire and you're investigating it and it's determined to be accidental, then it doesn't necessarily fall into the purview of arson. Uh, arson is a crime and arson is a federal crime and that is why I get involved in so many cases. I've done over three dozen in my career and uh, quite frankly I'm very passionate about it. Um, when I was talking to um, um, Brittany and, and uh, Andrea Strobel about this presentation uh, they got the feeling that I was pretty passionate about arson because I've done it so long. But when you think about it, arson affects every single person, every single private person, people like me that have an insurance policy. Um, every time a fraudulent claim gets paid, insurance companies, let's face it, you, you guys aren't gonna lose money. You're going to pass on those uh, uh, payments in, in, to your uh, criminals. Uh, as higher premiums to all of your honest people. So I take this very seriously. I am very passionate about arson. And without further ado, I'm going to share my screen um, with you. Okay. 
So can I get a thumbs up? Can everybody see that first slide? Not quite yet, Tom. No, okay, let's try it again. I may have to change the settings in my PowerPoint. Okay. How about now? Not yet. Not yet. Okay, fair enough. Let me exit out. I'm going to go into my PowerPoint and see if I can't change the slideshow view. <clears throat> and while Tom's working on this, that this is a perfect time for an editorial comment. This is why we are all so thoroughly sick of Zoom and we want to start having in-person conferences again. Okay. Okay. I believe this is working now. Is is that accurate? It, it is working. It looks great. Very good. Thank you very much for your patience. I do appreciate that very much. And I do agree with Sarah. Uh, normally, I give this presentation live in person, and uh, it's to be expected that occasionally we will have some technological bumps in the road, um, and that's one of the pitfalls to doing this. Uh, welcome to my, um, my spare bedroom. This is my home office. I've been working now from home for the last uh, 14 or 15 months, and um, while I can do most of my job in the field, there is a certain component of what I do that really does require um, me to be there and meet people and look people in the eye, especially when conducting interviews. So we'll cover that later in the presentation. Um, the course description for today uh, essentially is how you can enhance arson investigations with financial investigative techniques. And this is me as Sarah, so uh, aptly uh, introduced me, thank you so much. Um, I do have my MBA from Providence College. I have been with ATF since 04, and I've been in my current position uh, essentially since 07. And I say my current position, even though I've only been a supervisor since 06, I have, um, I'm sorry, since 2016, so the last five years, um, I am still an active working forensic auditor even though I supervise a group. So we have a, a few objectives today. One, I'd like to introduce you to the Bureau of ATF and the Financial Investigative Services Division or FISD. I'd like to introduce you to the financial aspects of arson investigations and what it takes for a successful prosecution. And I realize that's different than what you may see because you are not dealing with investigators or necessarily with prosecutors, um, but I'm gonna show you how in conducting your investigations, you can help us. And then I'd also like to talk about some of my case studies. And I have several set aside for the end and based on the time that we have, we'll do anywhere from one to four or five. And I'll also take questions at the end as well. So. You've all seen this movie, The Untouchables. And we all know who this guy is right here, Elliot Ness, who is the precursor to ATF's um, special agents. And Elliot Ness was a special agent for the Treasury Prohibition Bureau, who are the precursors to the Bureau of ATF. And you know what, he, what Elliot Ness was, was trying to accomplish. He was going after this guy and everybody knows who he is, Al Capone. Now, ultimately, Elliot Ness, who knew that Al Capone was committing serious crimes of, of violence with his Tommy guns 
and uh, with bribing officials, with uh, uh, killing people in broad daylight. Um, he was overall a, a pretty bad guy and a very dangerous guy at the time. Um, but Elliot Ness had an issue. Uh, Al Capone was very difficult to link to these violent crimes. They couldn't link him to direct shootings or, or, or pay uh, you know, kickbacks and things like that. So he recruited a gentleman to look at Al Capone's finances. So I have a quiz. We're going to start this day off, this presentation off with a quiz. Can you name the accountant that took down Al Capone? And it is in the movie. And generally, when I do this live, I have a $5 uh, gift card for Starbucks. And the first person to come up with the answer, I give this, this card to. So um, if we can, at the end, determine who is the first person to correctly get this answer, I will mail you a $5 gift card for Starbucks so you can buy your favorite beverage, uh, whether it be a latte or a cappuccino. I'm more of a cappuccino guy myself. Um, so can you name the accountant that took down Al Capone? I know that I can, so I'm going to answer. I think we've given everybody sufficient time. You can use your phones, by the way. I'll give you 30 more seconds. His name is Frank Wilson. And generally I follow up my quiz with, so you got four guys, a guy on the left, a guy on the right, a guy in the middle, and a guy standing. Can you name the guy who's, who's Frank Wilson? And that's the guy that's standing. Very few people get that right for some reason. So Frank Wilson was the original ATF forensic auditor. Obviously, I came around years later. So what is ATF's mission? Well, we want to build a sounder and safer America through innovation and partnership. Partnership with who? Well, local law enforcement, um, industry, Congress, et cetera. Uh, and how do we achieve our mission? We conduct investigations. We help local and state police and fire marshals. Uh, we help um, take violent criminals off the streets. We regulate the firearms and explosives industry. That's how I got my start at ATF. I regulated those industries by conducting application and compliance inspections in the areas of firearms and explosives uh, dealers. We report that information, information to Congress. And why? Because Congress has all the money. Uh, that's how we get, we get our funding. And we conduct seminars and trainings like we're doing today. And we do it in these areas, firearms trafficking, explosives, criminal groups and gangs, your, your drug dealers, especially the local gangs and drug dealers that have a propensity to shoot one another since firearms is in our DNA, so to speak. Um, while the DEA handles multi-level international and national drug smuggling, uh, we handle more of the violent shooters on the street and the criminal groups and gangs to try to keep the public safe. We also do alcohol and tobacco diversion. While I've never done any alcohol work, I have done several tobacco diversion cases. And our biggest one, or at least the biggest one that I work on, is arson for profit. And that's the uh, goal today to talk a little bit more about that and teach you what arson for profit is. So what is a financial, an ETF financial investigation? Well, it's the part of the criminal investigation that looks at how much money these criminals are making or, or profiting from their illegal activities or their motive for a crime. And clearly a drug dealer's motive is to make money. Uh, maybe a firearms trafficker 
is motivated by money or by ideology. But for our sin, we're looking at, at motive and we'll talk about the different types of motives of crimes in a later slide. Um, and that's where you guys come in. You can, you can examine those motives and determine whether or not a fire may have, have been intentionally set. So as our criminal investigators, our CFIs, certified fire uh, investigators, dig a scene and look for physical evidence of an arson, I will conduct and our for forensic auditors will conduct a concurrent financial investigation to determine whether or not there was a motive for a crime. And why do we conduct financial investigations? Well, we want to attack the cause of that activity. We can enhance the criminal investigations by showing the physical part and nature of the crime, but also showing the financial nature of the crime. And when it comes down to sentencing, we can get enhancements, especially in the federal court system, we can get enhancements for ancillary crimes that have occurred as a result of the major criminal activity. And then we also want to quantify it so that maybe we can get some restitution and make the victims whole in some way. And quite frankly, insurance companies potentially could be victims of crime, especially with arson, where you, maybe you've paid out a claim and later on it's determined that it was arson and that person gets convicted. Maybe you can somehow get that money back through the restitution process. So we've covered objective one. Objective two, we wanna cover the financial aspects of arson investigations. And we take a team approach. Why do we do that? Well, I'm a forensic auditor. So I'm really good at looking for financial crimes, looking at records and bank records, public records, insurance records. But I'm really not very good at digging a fire scene to determine where it started or how it started. But our CFIs, the certified fire investigators, and state and local fire marshals and insurance company SIUs, well, you guys are really good at digging fire scenes and determining what happened with a fire, determine whether or not it was intentionally set. I couldn't do that. Hopefully, when I say that, you know, we don't have people that can do what I do, so they need me and I still continue to get paid to do my job. Um, the insurance companies, you guys have your investigations. You, you have your investigators and you're gonna send your investigators out to a fire scene and conduct an investigation as would our fire investigators. We'll get into how, but you know, you, you'll be conducting interviews, digging the scene, gathering evidence, sending it to your lab, making determinations. And you're also gonna hire an attorney, unless you have one on staff, that's going to conduct an examination under oath or an EUO. And I find those particularly helpful. Some of the best evidence I've ever gotten in some of my cases has been through the examination under oath conducted by an insurance company investigator, uh, by a professional attorney who's really good at asking very difficult questions and putting the, your clients in the hot seat to determine all of the facts of, of the case. And that provides me with a great amount of information. How do we get the information as a, as a federal investigator uh, looking at a fire? How do we get that information from an insurance company? Through the arson immunity letter. And I'll get into more detail in the arson immunity letter later, but essentially it exonerates, you know, the ATF cannot turn to the insurance company and say, do this job for me and turn over all of your evidence to me uh, so that you don't have to pay out your claim. You're a fiduciary for your clients. You have a responsibility to make them whole in the event of a loss. But through the arson immunity letter process, you can help us out without us 
necessarily, you know, directly helping you out. We'll get into that a little more detail later on. Um, and we take a team approach because when the criminal investigators dig the scene, work with the state and local law enforcement and the fire marshals and the state and local police, the ATF agents can also reach out to me and my group for forensic auditors. They can reach out to our laboratory. And we have a huge laboratory in Amondale, Maryland that does something similar to what maybe your labs do. And that is they can take debris samples and they can send them, the agents can send those debris samples to the lab and determine whether or not there was a chemical or uh, a petroleum pour and determine whether or not uh, there was an accelerant found at the scene. We can also send in electrical engineers and site surveyors. It, it, you'll see in some photos of a case I worked on, it was a huge team approach and we had great results, but not any one individual could have done that by themselves. And the other thing that ATF can provide are canines. Um, we have dogs that can come in and uh, essentially uh, smell for accelerants. And then of course, ultimately, the leader of all of this from a law enforcement perspective is the prosecutor. Uh, we probably wouldn't be able to even do our jobs. There'd be no need to do our jobs if we did not have prosecutors that would actually take these cases to court. And, and they're very difficult circumstantial cases. So you need a prosecutor that is willing to roll up their sleeves and do the work. Um, so it's without a doubt, it's one of the areas uh, in federal law enforcement that requires uh, help from a lot of different areas. And I explained why, because you roll up on a scene that looks like this, and I wouldn't know where to begin. I wouldn't know where to look for first. So we have to send in guys like this that can dig a scene and do the physical work on the ground while I'm doing work in the background looking at finances, just like that. So I get this question often, especially from my, my special agents, my CFIs, my certified fire investigators, who sometimes call me months after a fire has already been put out. They've already dug the scene. They've already determined that it's a questionable fire, but for some reason they don't call me early. And that potentially could pose problems. People forget when we go to interview people, the best way to do it is to do it as close to the to the fire uh, occurrence as possible. So what I tell my agents is please call me early. I don't care if the building is still burning. If you have questions about it, I can show up on scene as you saw in previous photos. I can show up early and I can start digging right away, digging into the financial weeds while they dig the fire scene. So how can insurance companies help with the financial aspects of an arson investigation? Well, in, in a lot of ways, by conducting your own investigation in, in conducting a thorough investigation. Many of your companies have resources like labs. And if you don't, then you also have private labs that you would take uh, samples of debris from a scene and send it to a private lab. You can conduct interviews, especially the owner interview, your policy holder, you're going to bring them in. Everybody has, I don't know how many people have actually read their insurance policy with all those pages behind the deck page, but there are a lot of things listed in the policy that say, if you file the claim, you have to cooperate with an investigation into your claim. Generally, they have to comply, they don't have a choice. They have to do an examination under oath if the insurance company has requested one. Uh, you can interview other parties, uh, employees, um, ex-wives, 
um, ex-business partners, vendors. So by conducting an investigation, by conducting interviews, by conducting an examination under oath, by examining records, in again, in the policy, it states, person has to cooperate with an investigation. So if you ask for tax returns, which are very difficult for me to get, but they're a lot easier for you to get, then I'll, I'll talk about the arson immunity letter, but through the arson immunity letter process, I can in turn get those records and that enhances my investigation. So we talked about interviews. And the most important interview would be the owner interview. Now I say the owner interview, so I'm gonna follow up real quick. Um, generally speaking, ATF, federal government, our nexus into an arson is interstate commerce. So if there is a commercial fire, a fire of a business, then typically that's our nexus in. Quite typically for a non-business fire, for a residential fire, a dumpster fire, a car fire, generally speaking, it would not be elevated to a federal case. Now, I have been involved in residential fires. I'm actually working two of them right now. At the behest of a federal agent who's helping out a state and local fire marshal. So these, so the work I'm doing will not support a federal case, but it will support a state and local prosecution. So I'm working with a local district attorney's office and a local fire marshal helping the federal agent out to solve the financial issues, uh, financial complexity of residential fire cases. But that's not normally what I do. Um, of the dozens of fires that I've worked, the vast majority have been commercial fires. So with that said, the owner interview is the most important thing that I can do, that our fire investigators can do, that you can do if you, if you happen across a commercial fire. And you wanna find out a lot of different things, but I would not suggest that you take out a notebook and start rattling off a bunch of questions. Instead, you wanna engage your business owner into a conversation. How was business? Do you have any partners? How do you, how were you incorporated? What's your EIN? Um, ask them for your tax returns. Ask who the accountant is. Ask whether they use QuickBooks or other types of proprietary computer programs in order to maintain their records. Um, ask them, say, I've got to ask the owners to sign a 4506, which is a voluntary release of tax returns. You may directly be able to ask them for copies of the tax returns so that you can conduct your investigation to pay their claim. You can hold that over their heads where I cannot do that. So there are a lot of things that you can ask, but it's gotta be in the context of a conversation as opposed to an inquisition. You want it to be thorough and you want it to be controlled and you want them to talk 90% of the time. What I generally do is I start off with some closed ended questions that are real easy for them to answer. How are you incorporated? Um, are you a, a stock company or uh, are you a C-Corp, an S-Corp? Um, are you a partnership? Who's your accountant? Real easy things that they can answer. And then I ask broader questions, open-ended ones like, please tell me about how business was. How was it during the last year? Um, we're in a pandemic now. How did the pandemic affect your business? How did it affect, how did it affect your employees? Tell me about the employees that you have working here. So you wanna ask open-ended questions. And as you could tell, I, I talk fast and I talk a lot, but you would probably be surprised during an interview, I'm surprisingly very quiet, where I'll ask a question and wait. And I wanna see their movements. I wanna see if they're looking on the ground or if they're looking in the air. 
And I want to find out by their body language whether or not they're telling me the truth. Because I love it when they lie to me. And I want these people to lie to me. If they've intentionally burned their business and they lie to me during their interview, well, that's going to really help me out later on when I start digging into their finances and conducting other interviews with people. When I find those inconsistencies and those lies, well, then that tells me that they might be complicit. Always leave the door open for future discussions and always end with a complicity assessment question. Now, you may not be, be very familiar with the complicity assessment question, but here is a really good one, especially if you're working on an arson case. And that is, you ask that owner, what do you think should happen to the person that did this to you? And if they're complicit, they're going to say things like, well, a lot of people make mistakes or gee, you know, I really don't know what, what should happen to them. I, I guess that's up to you. Um, but if they're a victim, if someone has intentionally burned their building down and they weren't involved, well, they're going to be fired up. And they're going to say, I want them, uh, uh, with, I want the book thrown at them. Um, I want the, to the fullest extent of the law. I want to see uh, them go to jail. Um, uh, lock them, lock them up, and throw away the key it is generally what you would expect for someone who's not complicit. So we always end with a complicity assessment, and there's certainly a lot of other things you can do. Ask them to open up their wallet. Um, ask them to walk you. Ask you can ask them to walk uh, you through their last 24 hours of what of what they did. Things like that. Okay. So you want to lock in their story in their alibi, because later on you're going to get the cell phone records and you're going to determine whether or not they were there or not. Uh, and, and or you'll look at their credit card records. You might look at their uh, bank records to see if they used a debit card in the area around the time of the fire and things like that. But you want to lock them into that story because lies and inconsistencies are my best friends when it comes to uh, conducting uh, an interview when, when conducting a, a, a successful um, case. And you also want to find out if you, if, again, if you have an opportunity to in the interview, have they had any undetermined sources of income? Like, have you won the lottery? Um, have you gotten an inheritance? Things like that. So I mentioned in a previous slide that aside from the business owner, who is the most important person that you can interview, that there are other people that you might want to follow up with to determine whether or not you got the truth. So you want to talk to employees, ask them how business was, ask them if there have been any changes recently um, in the operations of the business, but also in the mood of the uh, of the employer, of the uh, business owner. You'd certainly like to talk to the accountant. I've had several accountants turn to me in the initial interview when I show up with a subpoena to say, why are you going after my client? And the simple answer is, I'm not going after anybody, but I am interested in the truth. And part of my job is to uncover, un look at, under every stone. Um, essentially, we want to look at every avenue. We want to talk to as many people as we can. We want to determine the truth about what's going on. And the tax records and business records that an accountant possesses can be very valuable to me. We certainly want to talk to the insurance agent. Not only and, and the reason why the agent and not just the insurance company is what if that particular business owner was shopping around for new insurance policies before the fire or reached out to his agent and asked for uh, prices on increased uh, insurance um, limits on the policy, uh, increasing a policy from 250,000 
to 750,000 two or three months before a fire would certainly be considered a red flag. So we want to talk to the insurance agent and get their records. We also want to conduct a neighborhood canvas. Any witnesses in the area, any neighbors, any adjoining businesses, um, we want to see if they've seen anything or heard anything. Um, quite often, you know, if, if you live in a neighborhood that's anything like my neighborhood, uh, we, we always have a Mrs. Kravitz who kind of knows everything about everybody's business. Well, if you happen to talk to her and she says, gee, it's awfully strange that X, Y, and Z was happening over the last few weeks when that never happened before. Well, that certainly could prove useful in your investigation. We also want to talk to vendors and suppliers. I find it useful that if a vendor reports to me that for two, three, four years prior to the fire, the business always paid their bills on time. But in the last few months, all of a sudden they're struggling to make payments. Well, that's a red flag that tells me that I need to dig into um, their accounts payables. Um, and quite often, what I will do is reach out to the vendors and suppliers with confirmations to determine what is owed and how old that, that debt is that's owed to them. Um, we also want to talk to bankers and creditors. And we want to determine uh, whether or not um, loans have been applied for, um, whether new accounts have been applied for, and maybe they've been denied credit or, and other things. So there's plenty of people you can interview, but always interview exes, ex-wives, ex-business partners, etc. cetera, especially if the uh, breakup was not amicable. Um, and quite often we find in businesses, breakups are, are, are unfortunately like marriages. Uh, when they break up, sometimes, sometimes they're bitter. And um, we've had a lot of success with interviewing exes. We've gotten tremendous amount of information for our cases by doing that. So always keep in mind, if there's an ex, interview it. Another source of information are business records. And where would we get those? From my perspective, I would start at the scene. I show up, sometimes the records look like this. Sometimes they're wet, sometimes they're dirty, sometimes they're charred. But even from this charred block of records, I might be able to pull up an account number or a bank or a creditor. So, I start at the scene if the scene is available for me to look at and dig. For you as investigators, if you are called to a fire scene and requested to, to help out, I don't know the rules whether or not you can just go in and start taking things. I know that I cannot. I have to get a search warrant or a subpoena uh, at the scene to be a search warrant. And I come armed with a search warrant, unless something is out in plain view, like things are on the desk here, and we've got some maintenance and repair records in that lower left-hand shot, and I've got a file cabinet. Well, the things that are out on the desk and I can look at and make notes of and take photos of, well, that's fair game. But if it's in a file cabinet, I need um, a warrant in order to get it. You probably need permission from your insured in order to open up that file cabinet, but you can certainly ask him to do that for you. So what are some of the things that we might see at the scene? Well, we covered the owner might voluntarily or by consent give you records. I have to get them through subpoena or search warrant and you can, you can interview the owner at the scene in order to to get more things. But we would expect 
day-to-day -day business records, vendor records, customer records, passwords. If you're at a scene and on occasion, I've run into this in one of my cases where things that were supposed to be there were no longer there. Well, that's a red flag as well. If you're talking to an office manager who says, gee, we always kept XYZ records in this file cabinet, and now I'm looking through it and it's empty. Well, that's a problem. Does that mean maybe someone's trying to hide something and they remove those records from the scene before they burn the building down? It's something to keep in mind. We'd also expect to see ledgers, calendars, emails. Um, I guess this is an old presentation. Uh, adding tape machines. I don't think we see too many of those anymore. But um, to-do list, uh, uh, receipts, cash and credit card statements, checkbooks. Uh, we expect to see these sorts of things at the, at the scene. Okay. So, as a federal investigator, my goals of, of an investigation, of an arson investigation, are different than yours. My goal, if, if a build business has been intentionally burned, my goal is to make sure that justice is served, that the person who's responsible for intentionally burning their building down uh, gets prosecuted. And either goes to jail, pays restitution, somehow pays for their crime. Your objectives are to make sure that due diligence is done when you're looking at a fire and if it's determined that it's intentionally set and your insured was involved, that you won't, be, you won't pay out an insurance claim, that, that, that you'll be doing due diligence for your company. And ultimately, what, what I need to determine was what the financial condition of the business and the owners uh, was at the time of the fire. And once we start digging, I mentioned this, or mentioned this earlier, once we start digging into the finances of a business and a business owner, from a criminal standpoint, we're gonna find other crimes in those business records. Maybe we'll find that they applied for a loan using a false tax return. That's bank fraud. The fact that they filed an insurance claim and if the insurance claim was later determined to be false, that's wire fraud or mail fraud, depending on how they filed that insurance claim. There is no federal statute for insurance fraud. However, there are state and local statutes for insurance fraud. So by conducting my financial investigation, if I determine that it's arson, quite often I'll determine, I'll, I will also, by the very nature of arson, determine insurance fraud. And we find other things like money laundering, bankruptcy fraud, embezzlement from the company, shareholders and such. Um, so, I have to be cognizant of these things when I'm conducting my financial investigations. After the scene, and I mentioned, you know, I like it when my investigators call me early, but sometimes they don't. Sometimes they call me months later. So what can I do? In, in all cases, whether they call me earlier or, or later, I can always do background and database searches. I can look at public records. I can look at Secretary of State records in corporations. I can look at deed records. Deed records at the Registry of Deeds include when they bought the building, uh, any um, liens, mortgages, uh, and, and things like that. I can determine those in the first hour of going to the Registry of Deeds. I can get records through the arson immunity letter, grand jury subpoenas, ex parte orders. That's how I get federal tax returns. So it really helps me if you get those for me instead. And we can get search warrants or consents to search 
after the scene. And what types of database searches am I doing? Everyone does a Google search. There's so much information out there on the internet. The first place we start is, is the internet. Find out if any press has been written about a person or if they have any um, public pages on Facebook and other things. So we're gonna use the internet. I mentioned deeds. Registry of deeds has a plethora of information on a building. Secretary of State's. CBRS, now that's something that you do not have access to. Uh, FinCEN, the financial, in, um, um, the IRS has a financial crimes bureau that retains records. I have access to that. So I wanna find out if my um, uh, perpetrator of, a, of uh, this potential crime has any filings with FinCEN. Um, with the IRS. So I will do a CBRS, Currency Banking Retrieval System query. And I will look for forms that, that have been filed there. Accurant is just a public record search engine that I can use, um, but you can also do your own public record searches in ISO claims. And you should all be familiar with ISO claims. Um, it's uh, the NICB, the National Insurance Crime Bureau, uh, search database, and I look for prior insurance claims. The tremendous uh, research. It's the, as you can see, ISO claims is the only comprehensive uh, claims database search. They do not list federal or state uh, investigators in, in this little body in the middle here, but I can tell you uh, for every case that, uh, that has an insurance component like arson, that's one of the very first places I look. And quite often, we will find a history of other claims. And what's very useful about that is once a person gets to know how the claim process works and what they're more comfortable with filing a claim, the more likely it is that they'll file multiple claims. So when I do an ISO claims database search and I find different sorts of claims, um, slip and fall, roof and hail damage, water damage. Uh, and I find multiple claims in the years leading up to the fire and then all of a sudden there's a fire. Well, that's a little bit of a red flag for me. It tells me that the person I'm looking at knows the system and maybe they're exploiting it. So I mentioned the arson immunity letter and I have a link to one. I hope it works when I click it. Ah, there it is. Okay. So the arson immunity letter essentially says that we would like information from you, the insurance company regarding this client and we provide social security number and name and address. And we say that pursuant to the provisions of the Arson Reporting Immunity Act, we would essentially like all of the information that you have, including investigative reports, applications, premium payments, claims history, et cetera, et cetera. We want your whole file. Why do we do this? essentially to get you off the hook. You have a fiduciary responsibility to your client. When they have a claim, you're supposed to make them whole. Yes, after you conduct your investigation. Here's the kicker. If we didn't provide you with an arson immunity letter, then it's likely that they would say that you were working in collusion with federal investigators to deny their claims when that is not the truth, because the information goes one way. It goes from your insurance company to me. And whatever I determine in the course of my investigation does not go back to you. Um, you might learn about everything that we did at a trial, but up to the point that there's a trial, you're not going to learn anything about my investigation. 
but it behooves you to cooperate and help us out because if we determine that a fire is arson and we do all of the work necessary to adjudicate that case successfully, then it helps you in denying the claim to be able to turn to your insured and say, hey, you were, you were convicted of, of a federal crime of arson. Um, you were complicit in this and we're denying your claim or we are going to sue you for the money that we paid you. So it does help you in the long run. And also it helps in that knowing that there is a body, an investigative body out there that cares about arson, that is going to do their job to put arsonists in jail. Well, then in, in the long run, that helps you too because maybe fewer people would consider burning their business down if they start having financial difficulties in their business. Um, and I talked a little bit, you know, quite a bit about what we would get in the arson immunity letter, um, but we would essentially get everything, including um, the examination under oath or the statements under oath. Okay. The further from the fire, the harder it is, maybe not impossible, but the harder it is to get records and do a good case. So we wanna lock this stuff in as, as, as early as we can. If the trial is starting and I have had case agents literally call me up uh, two weeks before a fire is starting, uh, excuse me, before a trial is starting to say, hey, do you think you can do a financial analysis um, for this trial? And the answer is no, because I have to do trial subpoenas just to get the records. So that in and of itself is probably going to take a month. And if your trial is starting, I'm not gonna have the financial information in order to do a thorough investigation. So uh, I include this um, with the insurance folks in that you wanna get your information from your insured uh, early and you want to get as much as you can in order to do a thorough investigation. So I mentioned in one of my very early slides that there are several motives for crimes. We commonly see need, greed, and passion as broad categories of motives for crime. I would imagine uh, and this is difficult in an online setting, in a Zoom setting, to say, hey, raise of hands. But um, generally speaking, for arson, we're going to find that it's a motive of need. We're going to find that the business owner was having financial difficulties, couldn't pay his mortgage, couldn't pay his employees, couldn't pay his vendors, has a lot of debt, has a lot of bounce checks we're gonna find that they needed to burn their building because the business income wasn't sufficient to cover the business expenses. Uh, we find diminishing um, revenues in, in generally increasing expenses. So we see a crime of need. However, we can also find arson cases that are of the greed nature. Uh, one of my colleagues early in my career worked a great case where a building owner in the North End of Boston, if you've ever been to the North End, that's where all the great Italian restaurants are. It's the Little Italy section of Boston. And he had a business owner, a building owner, that had a Dunkin' Donuts in the main floor on the street level in three apartments above. But he likened himself to be a real estate mogul and he wanted Dunkin' Donuts to break the lease and get out so that he could expand his building up several stories. I think he wanted to go up three or four more stories, widen his building a little bit, have some uh, mixed use and apartments and other things in there. But Dunkin' Donuts was in a long-term lease and they were not willing to get out of it. So he actually had his brother burn the building down and his brother perished in the fire. He did not get out. And um, 
the, Fred, the forensic auditor that did that analysis was able to show this is the income stream in its current state, in, in the proposed state that this guy had envisioned his building to be, this would be another income stream. And there was a big disparity. So that would be a crime of greed. And the crime of passion would be the ex, the ex-lover, the ex-wife, the ex-business partner. Well, if I can't have it, neither can you. Um, and, and quite typically, uh, we do not, I don't see very many of those in my line of work. Uh, I see more of the crimes of need. So the financial motives for arson for profit are numerous, numerous, as you can imagine. The biggie being insurance fraud. They want to burn the business and sell it to the insurance company because they were losing money. Or they want to retire. Or they've committed other crimes like they're running drugs out of the building or running a drug, drug lab, uh, or they want to destroy business different uh, business records. Uh, they have a, a failing um, with their partners, et cetera. So in conducting our financial investigations, early on, we can look for these red flags. And I did not, and I'll show you, I believe there are three slides of this. And they're all somewhat common sense. Nothing that I do is so complicated that anyone can't understand it. Now, maybe you won't be able to conduct a forensic financial investigation because you don't have certain tools that I have at my disposal. Um, and maybe you don't have the time to look through voluminous bank records and insurance policies and credit records and other things. But I do have the time to do that and I get paid to do it. And, and I think I do it fairly well. But some of the things that you can look for that don't require special knowledge is the guy's you know, running negative balances in his checkbook. He's not paying his vendors. Uh, everybody understands that. Um, he's lost credit with his vendors. Uh, they put him on cash, uh, that his expenses have increased. He's borrowed more money. They sold a key piece of machinery to pay their bills when, how can they run the business without that piece of machinery? Uh, they've been put on CODs, have multiple bank accounts or been thrown out of banks, um, et cetera. As many financial red flags as you can think of, they're, they're out there and, and I've run into uh, many of them, including uh, paying using personal money to pay for company expenses. And quite often we see, especially in very small businesses, the, the business was fiscally poor. Uh, the business owners thought that, hey, this income that I'm taking in from my company, well, that's my money, so I can do whatever I want with it. And they give their kids and their wives debit cards and credit cards with the company name on it. And all of a sudden their expenses go through the roof and they wonder why they're losing money. Um, so that's a financial red flag. And the, one of the biggies is increasing the insurance um, um, limits prior to the fire. So what do I need for a successful arson prosecution? Well, I have to gather the evidence. We talked about that. And then I have to analyze it and summarize it, which I will show you in some case studies. Once I analyze it and summarize it, I've got to be able to communicate that. But I can't communicate it in such a manner that anyone can't understand because there are not a lot of accountants that are gonna be on the grand juries and on the trial juries. They're more likely gonna be average everyday, you know, folks that, you know, work in bakeries that are, um, you know, secretaries and are, um, they're nurses and, and other non-financial professionals. 
So if I cannot communicate that information to them, then it's essentially useless. I don't wanna see blank faces. I wanna see the aha moment where they're looking at my slides and say, that's why he burned the building down because he was losing money and his expenses were through the roof. And we always, when we put together our case, we always think of how the defense attorney is gonna look at the case and say, well, that can be explained away in another way. So we try to anticipate potential issues and come up with the truth, because again, we are not skewing the truth in our investigations. We are trying to do a litmus test on what really happened, what was really the circumstance of the business at the time of the fire. But we also try to anticipate what, what sort of objections we're gonna get, and then we address them. So lastly, and we're, my timing, I don't believe could have been any more perfect because I anticipated one hour of a somewhat, um, hopefully, hopefully not too boring, but um, me talking a lot about uh, how I do my job. And now I'm gonna actually show you case studies that, where I actually did my job. And I'm hoping that that aha moment comes for all of you where, yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, I can see why he burned his, his building down or um, you know, maybe he was, uh, uh, maybe this particular person was uh, desperate. So I anticipate a one hour and then maybe a half hour of case study. So we are right on time. We'll, we'll, we'll go with a, a, a little softball case. This was my very first case as an ATF forensic auditor. Okay, can everybody see the, when I hit that hyperlink, can everybody see this slide on the hyperlink? Yep. Perfect, okay. So this particular case um, was a fire that occurred around the holidays in 06. What's significant, I started, if you recall, I started in my division in February of 07. So this was a fairly fresh case. And a, a CFI, a certified fire investigator from the ATF Providence office called me up and asked me to do a financial analysis in support of this case. The date of the fire is important, December 27th, 06, and I'll explain why later. So it occurred around the holidays at a furniture manufacturing company in Providence. The business was owned by a gentleman by the name of Marcus Gorkin, who owned the property under MLG Properties. I was able to ascertain that through public records deed search. Several incendiary devices were strategically located in the building. How do we know that? Well, when the incendiary devices went off, and I will not describe to you the actual devices themselves, but this gentleman was an engineer and he was a really smart guy and it was a furniture company. So he used some of the components of his furniture um, manufacturing process, some furniture materials in order to build his incendiary devices and he set them off in the basement and on the main manufacturing floor of the building. And this was an old mill building in the city of Providence. And, and if you're familiar with, well, you're all familiar with the Northeast, there are a lot of old mill buildings um, in the Northeast and this was one of them. The incendiary devices in the uh, main floor worked, they went off. But the problem was the incendiary devices on the main floor were, once they went off and they started this fire, the sprinkler system kicked on and doused the fire and put it out. The incendiary devices that were located in the basement failed. They did not, they did not work. 
had they worked properly, the entire building may have burned down because there were no sprinklers in the basement. And the, the building may have had enough fire damage in the basement and have it rise up through the old rafters of the building and in the walls and, and such that it would have overtaken the sprinkler system. So it was key that, that this brilliant engineer guy who placed these incendiary devices that, they, that some of them failed and we were able to get them intact. So what did we do? I, I mentioned that we, we can't just get records by uh, going in and taking them, but instead we got a search warrant and the Providence police seized the devices, some computers in a server. And then we issued subpoenas for business records and personal records for the business owner and his businesses to Bank of America, Sovereign Bank and the credit reporting agency. And what did we get? From the business's computer, we were able to determine, to determine that he used a software called um, Peachtree. Peachtree is a business accounting software similar to QuickBooks. Uh, QuickBooks obviously is the, the most widely used one by small businesses now. But back in 06, uh, Peachtree, which was written by a company called Sage down in Florida, uh, was commercially available. And I got the business's checking account, vendor list, accounts payable and aging, income statements, balance sheets, cash flows, et cetera. And all of this may sound like gibberish to you if you're not an accountant. And they may also sound complicated. But when I tell you what we did with it, I think you'll find that it was, it was fairly straightforward. So what did I do? I initiated an, a financial analysis to determine the status of the company as of the day of the fire. And what I found in those records, the Bank of America records and in the uh, Peachtree accounting records was that he had overdraft and non-sufficient funds as evidenced in his Bank of America business checking account ending in 8996. Why is that important? Well, because one, it shows me that he began to bounce checks and have overdrafts in 05. Those increased in 06. They totaled $35,000. Now, please keep in mind, these are not the actual items that were, that the check amounts that were bounced or the overdraft amounts. These are the fees that the bank charged. So at 35 bucks a pop, you can imagine just how many checks and non-sufficient funds this particular account experienced in a two-year period. And it's trend-worthy. We also see the same exact thing in the Sovereign Bank account, that in 05, he started to have financial difficulties and in 06, it increased with more bounce checks and insufficient funds. And again, these are fees, not amounts of the items. We also looked at in the um, SAGE um, accounting records that, that we looked at in the electronic accounting records from Peachtree, we looked at the aged payables and immediately it told the story of the 700 in, in change in outstanding receipt, uh, uh, payables that he owed his vendors, the vast majority of it, 633,000 was past 90 days due. So what did I do with that? In and of itself, that's evidence, but it's not good enough evidence to go to court with. They could easily say, and where I mentioned earlier, we have to anticipate what a defense attorney might say. Defense attorney might very well say, ah, that was the person that did the data entry. They only put in when the bills were due, but when they were paid, they never took them out. They never moved them to the other side of the ledger. I anticipated that. I anticipated them to say it was clerical or timing. So what did I do? I sent out um, uh, confirmations to all of the vendors. 
essentially what you would do is interview the vendors. Uh, but I sent them letters that said, hey, I am an ATF forensic auditor and I would like to know how much money Divine Furniture Manufacturing owes you in the age of your receivable and whether you, you have taken any collections action against the company. And I immediately started to get phone calls from the major vendors, from the, from the wood suppliers and the furniture component suppliers. And they, one attorney called and their client was owed over $100,000. And he said, that guy's a deadbeat. He's owed us money for months. Uh, we've been, we've, we have sent our, um, we sent collection agencies after him, dunning notices, and we're about to take him to court. And oh, and by the way, do you know he burned his building down? And he said to me, if you need anybody to testify, my client will gladly testify. Well, that was great for me because it's one thing for me to tell a story about a debt that is owed to a vendor, but it's a totally different story when you get a vendor on the stand that says, this guy is a deadbeat and I've been chasing him for months and he's given me the runaround. So by doing my job, I was able to produce a better case. I was able to determine through the business records that he was down about a million dollars from 05 to 06 in revenues. The nice thing when we saw that date, that important date of December 27th, well, that was December 27th, 06. And he worked on a calendar year, not a fiscal year. So these are really true numbers. A defense attorney won't turn around and say, well, that was only a partial year. No, it was a full year. And that's the calendar year method that you used in the books, in the bookkeeping, and in filing your taxes. So that helped me a lot. And what do you think that Mr. Glockin said in his initial interview? He said, business was great. We're gonna have one of our best years ever. Really? because you're down a million dollars. That's a red flag. And he lied to us. So we got a double bonus. It was great. He also took out a line of credit five months before the fire. Took out his line of credit. Now the application, it was for capital. He wanted capital improvements for his business. But what did he do? He immediately maxed it out. Um, Let's see, is that in there? Ah, okay, by August. So he took it out July 27th. And by the first week in August, oh, I'm, it is in there, August 2nd. So just a few days later, it was already maxed out. And with his, in, with his interest, it was already over the 100,000. And by the time of the fire, he had only paid it down by about $1,000. So he had made minimal payments on this line of credit. That was supposed to be for uh, a capital infusion to his company. So in summary, he had all these draft overdraft fees. He owed his vendors. He had declining sales. He took out a big line of credit. The fire was during, and, and you may well be aware because you're in the insurance industry and you're familiar with the Northeast, manufacturing companies in the week between Christmas and New Year's, quite often they typically shut down except for the maintenance crew. Maintenance will maintain the buildings and the machinery during the week between Christmas and New Year's. And also uh, they take a summer shutdown for the 4th of July. Then they send their staff home for their two weeks of vacation during those two weeks. Why was that important? Because he planned his fire so that no one would be there so that the only people that, that might happen upon it are his maintenance people. And that is exactly what happened. When his maintenance foreman showed up on the morning of, um, let's see, it would have been December 28th, he showed up in the morning and opened the door and, and there was water piling out of the business. So he went in and saw that it potentially might've been a fire. So he called 911. Fire department came, immediately did, saw the incendiary devices and called the police department. When Mr. Gorkin showed up for his initial interview, he was asked, 
to voluntarily open up his van doors. And when he did, the components of the incendiary devices were in his van. When he was asked to open his wallet, he voluntarily complied. And he had a Sonatrol card in his wallet that was not his, but it was of the person that last accessed that building. He went to one of his maintenance people and said that he lost his card and he needed his during, during the week shutdown. And the last pit, bit of information was this guy was in his late 60s and potentially was looking to retire from the business. His son and, and another business partner were looking to go in a different direction. And he wanted, um, he didn't want to go in that direction and instead wanted to retire. So there were a lot of different circumstances that occurred with this case. But it was a really good first case for me to cut my teeth on because it wasn't overly complicated. And anybody could see based on these records and based on the analysis um, that, that this fire was intentionally set. So that took 15 minutes. I'll take question and answers in a minute. I would like to go through one more case study if I could. I'd like to go through two. I'll go through this one very quickly. So the Kinsley Avenue fire was in 15. And it was also in Providence on Kinsley Ave. And the business was owned by Marshall and White. ATF responded and we determined that there was a drug lab in the building. I'll explain by going through the photos how we knew that. But we did a search warrant. And then we sent out grand jury subpoenas for financial information on their business. So these are some of the fire scene photos. This was a 93,000 square foot building. It was a huge uh, a huge uh, warehousing building. And I'm gonna click through these slides quickly so you can see the damage that a fire can cause. And that's ATS and our T-truck that we used as a command post. This was uh, one of the perpetrators houses. So who says crime doesn't pay? Uh, he lives in a nicer house than I do. And there's me. And we dug the scene. Here's my finger. And this was a camper that was in the fire. So we were fearful that someone was living in the camper and died. So we did send a cadaver dog through and also a, um, a, a canine for uh, incendiary liquids. This was the remnants of a Corvette. Is ATF working in conjunction, partnership with the Providence Arson Squad. Uh, uh, Sean Reddy is the arson expert in Providence at the time who is now working in the insurance industry as a, uh, a private arson investigator. And yes, ATF auditors get dirty and we look at records on the scene. And I did have a search warrant in order to do this digging and, and get these records. And I do get dirty on occasion, which not often, but I like doing it. And uh, it, it makes me feel like I'm part of the team. Again, we take that teamwork approach. And this is Jim Hartman, who is a very talented CFI, certified fire examiner for ATF. And you can see these tanks, which control butane. Butane hash oil is made, and I'll go through this very quickly. Essentially, you take all of the trim products from marijuana plants, like the stems and, and stalks that you can't smoke or turn into um, a, a, a digestible marijuana plant. But you take those that trim and you stuff it into a tube and you filter. And whoever would have ever thought of doing this is, is beyond my um, comprehension. But you filter butane through it and then you bake it off in an electric oven 
And what you get in the end is a resin called butane hash oil, which is very highly, um, it's got a very high percentage of THC, the hallucinogenic component in marijuana. And you can ingest that and you can smoke it and you can bake it into your edibles and, it, and it's very pure THC. Um, and that's what these gentlemen, uh, these, these guys were doing by conducting their illegal butane hash oil business. And uh, obviously things went awry and they burned their building down or a building down. They were, they were renting, they were leasing. And these are the ovens that they would use to bake off the butane and then recapture the butane and leave behind the butane hash oil resin. And I had to get, you saw those records I pulled out. Well, there were uh, several offices of records in the building and they were wet due to fire damage and they were dirty. But every one of them I used. And what I did was I, was I dried them out and I looked through them. And then I cut subpoenas to go to the companies to get the original records. Okay. So what did I do with that? So I got the subpoenas, uh, uh, I sent subpoenas out to Bank of America and American Express to the vendors and customers. I got bank statements, AMX statements, vendor purchases, sales data from customers. And ultimately I wanted to quantify the sales and profit from the butane hash, excuse me, from the butane hash oil business and also prove money laundering. I won't go through all of these numbers, but essentially money laundering, one of the components of money laundering is to use a bank account, and you see this bank account of America, Bank of America X2137 was used for their legitimate business, which was growing soil and pots and lighting and things like that. But they also used it to sell butane hash oil, to purchase the trim components, to purchase the welding supply items and the tanks and the ovens. Across International uh, sold them the ovens. Prax Air and Cranston Weldon sold them butane. So they were used in furtherance of the crime. Ultimately, White pled guilty to endangering human life while manufacturing a controlled substance, and Marshall pleaded guilty to money laundering. So sometimes when you start working on a case, you just kind of never know where it's going to go. Um, but it was a very interesting case. Ultimately, I don't know if an insurance payment was made because they leased the building and they leased the building from a prominent Providence attorney. And I don't know if the claim was paid. And that's a story for another day. But um, I do know that if they had a contents claim or a renter's claim, it probably wouldn't have been paid based on their guilty pleas. Okay, in the last case study that I think is particularly interesting, and it's, it's an interesting story, is this one. And I know I'm going fast, but I'm hoping that um, this helps. Oh, so now we've got a pop-up quiz. What kind of letter would you get from us so that I can get information from you so that your company wouldn't get sued by your insured. I did talk about that on several slides. Okay, so Mr. Carmu, Mr. Carmu is a kind of a, a, a sad story. He migrated to the United States from Liberia 
And as you're aware, Liberia is having a massive civil war and, and, and it's a very dangerous place to be and, and to live. And, and Mr. Carmu came to the United States in search of a better life. One of the things that he did was he purchased a tenement home. So you might be wondering, hey, it's a house. Why did ETF get involved? Well, he collected rents and therefore it was a business to which he filed the Schedule E um, income from rental properties on his federal tax return. That gives me federal nexus into an arson at a residential building. And, and it was multiple apartments. But typically, what we would say in Rhode Island, you know, you've got a tree decker, apartment number 31, 32, and 33 on either street in Providence. Um, if you've got a business a building owner that rents those out, then there is a federal nexus for me to work the case. So multiple family home, a tree decker uh, in Providence owned by Mr. Carmo and the Providence Fire Department and the ATF determined that it was in fact arson. So we sent out grand jury subpoenas to get records for himself personally and for his business. He owned a uh, trucking business. That's important and I'll cover the trucking business um, in, in a moment. So we sent the subpoenas out and we got records from Bank of America and from his tax preparer from a credit reporting agency and from the Rhode Island Division of Taxation. And what did we get? Account statements, um, mortgage information, payment history. From his tax preparer, we got tax returns. Um, we got electronic information from his uh, QuickBooks records that he maintained. We got a credit report and we got a state tax returns. But we were not able in the time that we worked the case to get federal tax returns. Um, everybody thinks that the whole big force of the federal government is coming down on you if ATF were to um, investigate you for a crime, when in reality, it's really just probably me and maybe another investigator. And I don't have a magic wand that I can wave and find out where you bank and find out your tax return information. Uh, I have to jump through major hoops to get it. Um, the Bank Secrecy Act uh, does not mean that your, your, your personal and business finances are, um, are, are not secret to the government, uh, when in fact they really are. Um, and it does take hoops for me to get those. And I'm certainly willing to do those, and, um, but in some cases getting tax returns is very difficult. So I like to get them through you. Okay, I digress. Back to the QuickBooks, we got financial information on the trucking company, financial statements, general ledgers, and tax information. And for public records, we always do public records because the deeds tell a big story. We learned about his mortgages in the deed records, liens that were put on the property, violations that the property had. And those are red flags, right? You have a property that's in distress, maybe he would want to get rid of it because he doesn't want to make the renovations to make that property inhabitable. He'd rather the insurance company buy it from him. Make it your problem. Uh, and from all state insurance, I got deck pages and premium information. And I did get the coverages and policies. So I initiated a financial investigation. And what I learned. And it's very important, it's, it, it, the dates, dates always tell a bigger story. So we all know about what was happening in the United States economy in 06. Housing prices were skyrocketing. Everybody was upgrading. Mortgages were being given out like, you know, free candy. Um, checks on income verification and on whether a property is, um, is uh, solid or not, they were not done by banks. Banks were giving mortgages to everybody because they knew that they couldn't lose. They were packaging and bundling up those mortgages and they were selling them on the secondary market and, and or those were insured by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. 
So the banks, as we all know, in 08, there was a big crash based on them not doing their due diligence in giving mortgages out to people that really didn't need them or deserve them. And the housing market skyrocketed in, in especially prior to 08, 06 and 07, the market values were very, very high. And that's when Mr. Carmu bought his property. So he couldn't get, and even in that market, the guy he bought it from, Mr. Santa, wanted 250 and Carmu only qualified for 200. So the, the previous owner held 50 grand of a mortgage. Ultimately, um, a couple of years later, three, less than three years later, it was refinanced through an FHA loan through a company called Taylor Bean and Whitaker. It didn't matter to them. They were just going to turn around and flip the mortgage to Bank of America anyway. And I see Sarah popped up. Sarah, I promise I'll be real quick. Maybe one more minute. Is that okay? Oh, we want to hear the rest of the story. All right. Fair enough. So um, what's important about an FHA loan? Well, an FHA loan is backed by, not me, but by the government. It's a federal housing authority loan. So it's important for the story. Go through the story quicker. In doing a deed search, public records, anybody can do this. I found violations for things like mice, poor electricity, debris, broken glass, et cetera, et cetera. The place was a crab hole. He lived on the third floor. Tenants lived on the second floor. And the first floor was not inhabitable due to electricity and mice and things like that. Why is this important? It's important because when Mr. Kamu hired someone to burn his building down, he had no regard for the five children that were sleeping on the second floor when this fire was occurred at about two o'clock in the morning um, when he paid somebody to set it. Uh, so I take these things rather personally. Um, you're gonna burn a building down. It's one thing to defraud an insurance company and to cause me to have increased insurance rates and be a fraudster. That's bad enough. But you wanna light a fire when there are five children sleeping on the second floor, that makes you a particularly bad person. So. Um, I get fired up when I work cases like this um, because this, this is a particularly egregious um, incident. Providence Fire Department did a wonderful job of getting everybody out safely and extinguishing the fire. But can you imagine if those children had perished, this guy not only would be facing federal arson charges, but also murder charges. So get back to the financial analysis. He had non-sufficient fund fees. We always see them. His bank account was forced closed just months before the fire. He had utilized four debit cards um, in the course of doing his business. So I was able to track his movements where he was. He was actually claiming unemployment uh, when he was driving his truck across the country. I could show him in Pennsylvania and in Oklahoma and in Texas, based on his credit card records, while he's collecting uninsurance fraud. Prior to the trial, he pled guilty to the uninsurance fraud, to the unemployment insurance fraud, because he knew he couldn't wiggle off that worm, that worm off the hook. Okay, the bank account, debits and credits are about the same, no transactions months before the fire, and he had a dollar eighty in his account. In his savings account, he had eighty-one dollars. So this guy had eighty-two bucks to his name. He was broke, and his apartment, uh, his business wasn't doing well. The principal balance on the loan was two hundred and thirteen thousand. He missed twenty payments. Again, big red flag. If you're not paying your mortgage, banks don't like that. And that tells me you're 20 months in arrears. His last payment was a year before the fire. I said that FHA, why is it important? 
Here's why. Because the bank continued to pay all state for the insurance premiums because they knew that they were gonna be made whole by the federal government with that mortgage insurance program money from the FHA. So Bank of America gladly paid the taxes, gladly paid the FHA mortgage insurance, gladly paid all state for the, for the hazard insurance. And why? They knew that it was backed. They paid it to the tune of $11,000 that he was in arrears on. And that's just the escrow account, not including the 20 missed payments. Why is it important that on August 13th, they made that payment? Because in his interview, he said, I'm not even insured. Well, we know he lied because they sent him a certified letter. Bank of America sent him a letter saying, we've just paid your hazard insurance payment for 3,200 bucks to Allstate so that the property is insured to protect our interests. And they sent it certified. So we knew that he knew that he was insured. So he lied to us. So we love it when they lie to us. And let's see, way late charges reversed and principal balance really never went down. But here's the crux of the thing. We knew that he had an insurance policy that he owed the bank 230 some odd thousand, but he was insured for 725,000 plus another 290 for personal property, another 72 for other structures. So he had a million, essentially a million dollar policy. And he was only gonna, they were only gonna pay the insurance company, the, the bank, they're only gonna pay the bank the 230,000 balance to which he probably thought that he was gonna get the difference. He was gonna get half a million or more dollars from burning this building down. So he had a half a million reasons to burn it down. Um, that's just a summary. We had all kinds of other things. I looked at the tax returns. We see real estate rental income, line 17. He was losing $10,000 a year on that house. So he wanted it gone. He was a deadbeat dad. Um, he wasn't paying child support in two states, but they wouldn't let me talk about that at trial because that would make him out like a bad guy. Like burning a building down with five children sleeping in it doesn't make you a bad guy. Um, but they wouldn't let me introduce that evidence at trial. Um, and you're going to love this. He paid the guy to burn his building down and wrote it off in his, on his, uh, as a business expense. And I found the checks in his QuickBooks records with payments of $9,500 going to the arsonist. So he ended up getting, and this is where I talk about why we do financial investigations in support of criminal investigations. He got five years for arson, 844I. He got 10 years for committing a felony using fire. He got one year for mail fraud and one year for wire fraud. He got 17 years in federal prison for his crimes. Quite frankly, I don't think that's enough based on what he did and what potentially could have happened. But in this case, justice was served. And I'm gonna end my presentation with that case because the other ones will take more time. And this is me in my youth when I first started with ATF uh, back in, um, in August of 04 at my basic training. And uh, thank you so much for your time. I hope this wasn't boring. I hope you found, even if you only picked up a few things that you can use in your careers. I, I hope it was helpful. And, and thank you so much for listening to me for the last uh, hour and 40 minutes. Well, Tom, thank you so much. It was absolutely fascinating. And um, I was actually hoping you'd be able to do a few more cases, but maybe uh, you'll come back again and um, tell us about some more. That gun looks really scary. Okay, so that's it for uh, today for our first and last, I hope, annual virtual PAMIC Claim Summit. So we're going to reconvene tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock with a presentation on social inflation, a very concerning topic. And we have some wonderful experts to help us through that. But thank you very much for tuning in. And um, I look forward to uh, 
you know, tomorrow's presentation. And thanks a million again, Tom. That was really wonderful. Thank you for having me. Have a good evening, everyone. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye.